By the time I was 15, my entire home had become contaminated. Showers were taking six to eight hours. I'd be out of, out of hot water, crying and shaking in the corner of the bathroom. Everybody continued to tell my family the same thing. We've never seen a case as severe as this. There's not help for your child, and you should accept that she may be in a mental health hospital the rest of her life. And there came a point where I truthfully believed that. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Mackingbell. Hear my story. You know, a lot of people, when they look at me and my sister and our family, we, we talk a lot about this, they'll say, you know, well, you guys did everything right, or like, you, you guys figured it out. That is not the case, right? Maybe now I, I'm semi-managing my illness and doing well enough that I can sit and talk and run a clinic and it looks like I have it all together, but that doesn't mean I don't struggle. But our journey to treatment sucked, and our journey to treatment was messy, and I think most of ours is. I talk a lot in a quick snippet of like, oh yeah, here's, I was sick, and then I went to inpatient treatment, and then I got better but let's talk about what it was like to actually get me there. Showers were taking six to eight hours. I'd be out of, out of hot water, crying and shaking in the corner of the bathroom. My mom would have to pull me out at 15 years old and dress me because the whole left side of my, or one side of my body was contaminated so I couldn't use it. And imagine what that's like, right? Being a teenager and adolescence um, with your mom getting you dressed. When you're capable of it, but your, your, your mind and brain tells you you're not. And so slowly my home and family all became contaminated and I eventually actually kind of moved out of my house. I was living with my best friend Ashley and her family at the time um, because I couldn't stay anywhere in my house. And I tried a million treatments and so I didn't think treatment worked. I had lost all hope and I didn't believe that I could get better. I didn't believe there was a chance for me, that there was a future, that I could have any hopes or dreams or even just be able to do simple things like take a shower and wear the clothes I wanted to wear for the day. It was February 5th of 2002. It was two days after my 15th birthday. My parents told me I needed to come home because I had an orthodontist appointment and so I believed them. And I came home, I, um, all the rooms in the house were contaminated but I, I slept in my sister's room that night. And I woke up the next morning and my sister was still home, she didn't go to school. And so I went downstairs, my parents both own businesses here in town, they work every day and both my parents were home. And that's when I knew something was up. Like my mom never cooks breakfast, there was breakfast cooked and my dad was there and it was like, this is strange. And so basically my parents told me they were sending me to an inpatient treatment facility called Menninger in Topeka. And I had heard of the clinic, we, I, I knew what it was and so I had no interest in going. Um, I decided I should run away. I'm not sure why, like, like where I thought I was gonna go or how far I was gonna get. Um, and unfortunately, my parents had thought about that too. So they had um, one of our good friends who was an ex-Navy SEAL there and to literally like tackle me and put me in the car and take me to treatment. And it was a horrible day. Um, I got on the plane with my family and I remember just pleading with them to give me a chance to let me try harder to not make me go. I remember my sister and everybody just you know, crying and begging and pleading for them not to leave me there, for them to not take me. And I remember telling them like, please give me another chance, I'll do anything I can. And you know, I think it just really makes you realize how much people with OCD hate it. Like we don't want it. We would do anything we could to get rid of it, but literally I had no control anymore. The illness had so much control over my life. Like my parents knew I, I would try to do anything I could to get rid of it and that I had been trying, but I couldn't. I was literally a prisoner to this illness at this point. I remember I got to the treatment facility and my parents signed me in and we got upstairs and my mom doesn't make a lot of promises in life. And so when she does, they're, they're always really true. And I remember she said to me, you know, Liz, um, I promise you're gonna get to come home when you're well. And for a lot of people, it's like, well, of course you're gonna get to come home with your well. Like, why are you worried about that? But you have to understand when people in your field, like mental health clinicians tell you that your prognosis is living in a psychiatric facility for the rest of your life, the thought of going to one and getting dropped, like getting there and getting dropped off at one, I truly believe this was my life sentence, that like my parents were dropping me off at a clinic that I would be at forever. And when my mom said that, I, I believed that she would take me home if I got well, but I didn't think I could get well. And so it was the most terrifying moment of my life. Um, I, I truly thought I was gonna be in that facility forever. And 
at the same time, sure, the way we got there was messy and was screwed up and like doesn't make sense, but it's what my family did. My mom would tell you she'd do it all over again, right? Because at the end of the day, she always says like, I knew that day was a day that could mean that you would hate me for the rest of my life, that you wouldn't get better and that it would have been a really bad decision. She's like, but that tiny chance that it was a place that could save your life, I was gonna take it. You know, I talk about there being two turning points in treatment for me. The first was getting evidence-based treatment there, but the second was sitting down on a couch next to a young girl who was 15 at the time who looked at me and all she said is, it's okay, I cried too. And for the first time, I really knew that there were people my age, like me, suffering like I was. And you know, there's so much value in both. But what I'll say is that mental illness, it's really an invisible disease, right? By the time I went to treatment, you could tell from the outside I was suffering, but you didn't understand the turmoil. You didn't understand the pain. And what I will tell you is that any of us with OCD, even when we're on the other side, we'd do anything in the world to help those that have OCD experience a reduction in that pain. If you think you or a loved one is struggling with OCD, remember and know that hope is accessible. I know what it can feel like to be in the throes of depression and in the middle of suffering that feels so intense that you don't believe or understand that there's a way out. But myself, and many others are a living testament to tell you that hope and help are always available. Treatment isn't easy. Treatment is hard. But treatment is worth every single challenge, every single pain because of the outcome. What I know is that despite my struggles, despite everything I've gone through, I can live an amazing life with a diagnosis of OCD and I believe and know that you can too. My favorite quote is that without our struggle, we wouldn't know our strength. And I truly do believe that. I believe that I, I know I would do anything for you to not have OCD and for me to not have the illness. But I believe that on the other side, we are stronger and we can take our pain and turn it into a purpose.